Welcome to episode 141 of Norse Myths, Legends, and Folktales. My name is Mylinda Butterworth, and today we find the Ash Lad has met a man who built for him a ship that flies and sails, and all he asked for in return was to add each man he met as part of his crew. The question is, what would this odd variety of men do to help the Ash Lad win the hand of the princess in the Ash Lad and his crew? Once on a time, there was a king, and that king had heard talk of a ship that went as fast by land as it did by water. So he set his heart on having such a ship, and he gave his word that the man who could build it should have the princess and half the kingdom. And this promise he had given out in every parish church in the realm, and at every parish meeting, there were many that tried their hands, you may fancy. For it was a nice thing to have half the kingdom, and it was brave to get the princess in the bargain. But it went ill for most of them. So there were three brothers away in the wood. The eldest was called Peter, the second Paul, and the youngest Espen Ashlad, because he used to sit and grub in the ashes. But it so happened that on the Sunday when the king's promise was given out, he was at church too. So when he got home and told the story, his eldest brother, Peter, begged his mother for some food, for he was bent on setting off and trying his luck. If he couldn't build the ship and win the princess in half the realm, so when he got his wallet full, he strode off from the farm, and on the way he met an old man who was so bent and wretched. Where away? asked the old man. Oh, said Peter. I'm off to the wood to make a platter for my father, for he doesn't like to eat out of the same dish with us. A platter it shall be, said the man. But what have you in your knapsack? Muck, said Peter. Muck it shall be, said the man, and they parted. So Peter strode on till he came to a grove of oaks, and they fell to chopping and carpentering. But for all his shoeing and all his carpentering, he could turn out nothing but platter after platter. So when it got towards midday, he was going to take a snack and opened his wallet. But there was not a morsel of food in it. And as he had nothing to eat and he did not get any better with the carpentry, he got weary of the work. And he took his axe and wallet on his back and strode off home to his mother again. Next, Paul was for setting off to try if he had any luck in shipbuilding and could win the king's daughter and half the kingdom. He too begged his mother for food, and when he had got it, he threw his wallet over his shoulder and set off from their farm. On the way, he met an old man who was so bent and wretched. Where away? said the man. Oh, I'm just going to the wood to make a pig trough for my little pig, said Paul. A pig trough it shall be, said the man. What have you got in your wallet? asked the man. Muck, said Paul. Muck it shall be, said the man. So Paul trudged off to the wood, and he fell to hewing and carpentering as hard as ever he could. But however... He hewed, and however he carpentered, he could turn out nothing but pig troughs and pig tubs. Still, he wouldn't give in, but worked till far on in the afternoon before he thought of taking a little snack. Then he got hungry all at once that he must take out his knapsack, but when he opened it, there was not a morsel of food in it. Then Paul got so cross that he rolled up the knapsack and dashed it against a stump, and then he shouldered his axe and trudged away home from the wood as fast as ever he could. So when Paul had come home, the ash lad was all for setting out in his turn and begged his mother for food. Mm, maybe I might be man enough to get the ship built and win the princess and half the kingdom. That was what he said. <laughs> yes, yes, a likely thing, said his mother. You look like winning the princess and the kingdom that you do. Uh, you 
who have done nothing else than grub and poke about in the ashes. No, <laughs> no, you don't get any food, said the goody. But the ash lad would not give in and begged so long that at last he got leave. leave Dave. As for the food, he got none. Was it likely? But he got by stealth two oat cakes and a drop of stale beer. And with that, he trudged off from the farm. Well, while he had walked a while, he met the same old man who was so bent and vile and wretched. Where away? asked the old man. Oh, I'm going into the wood to build me a ship which will go as well on land as on sea. For you must know that the king has given out that the man who can build such a ship shall have the princess and half the realm. What have you got in your wallet? asked the man. <laughs> Not much to brag of, said the ash lad, though it's called traveling fare. If you'll give me some of your food, I'll help you, said the man. With all my heart, said the ash lad. But there's nothing but two oat cakes and a drop of stale beer. It was all the same to him what it was, said the man, so that he got something, and he would be sure to help him. So when they got to the old oak in the wood, the man said to the land, Now you must chop out one chip, and you must put it back where it came from, and when you have done, that you may lay down and sleep. Yes, the ash lad did as he said. He laid him down to sleep, and in his slumber, he thought he heard someone hewing and hammering and carpentering and sawing and planing, but he would not wake up till the man called him. And then there stood the ship, all ready, alongside the oak. Now you must go aboard her, and everyone you meet you must take as one of your crew, he said. Yes, the ash lad thanked him for the ship and sailed off saying he'd sure to do what he said. When he had sailed a while, he came on a great, long, thin fellow who lay away by the hillside and ate granite. What kind of a chap are you, asked the ash lad, that you lie there eating granite? Well, he was so sharp set for meat, he could never have his fill. And that was why he was forced to eat granite. That was what he said. And then he begged if he might leave to be one of the ship's company. Oh, yes, said the ash lad. If you care to come, step on board. Yes, he was willing enough. And he took with him a few big granite boulders as his sea stores. When they had sailed a bit farther, they met a man who lay on a sunny slope and sucked at a tap. What sort of a chap are you? asked the ash lad. And what good is that you lie there sucking at that tap? Oh, said he, one hasn't got the cask. One must be thankful for the tap. Oh, he's so thirsty for ale that I can never drink enough ale or wine. And then he asked if he might have leave to be one of the ship's company. If you care to come on, step on board, said the ash lad. Yes, he was willing enough. And he stepped on board and took the tap with him, lest he should become thirsty. When they had sailed a bit farther, they met one who lay with one ear on the ground listening. What sort of chap are you? asked the ash lad. And what good is it that you lie there on the ground listening? I am listening to the grass growing, he said, for I am keen of hearing that I can hear it grow. And so he begged that he might be on the ship's company. Well, he did not get nay. If you care to come, step on board, said the ash lad. Yes, he was willing enough, and so up he too stepped into the ship. When they had sailed a bit farther, they came to a man who stood aiming and aiming. "'What sort of chap are you?' asked the ash lad. "'And why is it that you stand there aiming and aiming?' "'I am so sharp-sighted,' he said, "'that I am dead shot up the world's end.' And so he, too, asked if he might have leave to be one of the ship's company. 
If you care to come, step in, asked the ash lad. So he was willing enough. So he stepped up into the ship and joined the ash lad and his comrades. When they had sailed a bit farther, they came on a man who went about hopping on one leg, and on the other he had seven hundred weight. What sort of chap are you? asked the ash lad. And what's the good of your limping and hopping on one leg with seven hundred weight on the other? Oh, said he, I am light as a feather, and as if I went on both legs, I should be at the world's end in less than five minutes. And so he too begged, if he might have leave, to be one of the ship's company. If you care to come, step in, said the ash lad. Yes, he was willing and left, and he stepped on board to the ash lad and his comrades. When they had sailed a bit farther, they met a man who was holding his throat. What sort of man are you? asked the ash lad. And why in the world do you stand there holding your throat? Oh, said he, you must know I have seven summers and fifteen winters inside of me, so I've good need to hold my gullet, for if they all slipped out at once, they'd freeze the whole world in a trice. That was what he said, and so he begged leave to be with them. If you care to come, step in, said the ash lad. Yes, he was willing enough, and so he, too, stepped on board the ship to the rest. When they had sailed a great bit farther, they came to the king's grange. And then the ash lad stood straight into the king and said that the ship was ready out in the courtyard, and now he has come to claim the princess as the king had given his word. But the king wouldn't hear of it, for the ash lad did not look very nice. He was grimy and sooty, and the king was loath to give his daughter to such a fellow. So he said he must wait a little. He couldn't have the princess till they cleared a barn which the king had with three hundred casks of salt meat in it. All the same, said the king, if you can do it by this time tomorrow, you shall have her. I can but try, said the ash lad. I may have leave perhaps to take one of my crew with me. Yes, you might have leave to do that. Even if he took them all six, said the king, for he thought it quite beyond his power, though he had six hundred to help him. But the ash lad only took with him the man who ate granite, and was always so sharp set. And so they came next morning and unlocked the barn, if he hadn't eaten all the casts, so that there was nothing left, and half a dozen spare ribs, that was only one for each of his comrades. So the ash lad strove into the king and said now the barn was empty, and now he might have the princess. Then the king went out to the barn, and empty it was. That was plain enough. But still, the ash lad was so sooty and smutty that the king thought it a shame that such a fellow should have his daughter. So he said he had a cellar full of ale and old wine and three hundred casks of each kind, which he must have drunk out first, said the king. All the same, if you are man enough to drink them out by this time tomorrow, you shall have her. I can but try, said the ash lad, but I may have leave perhaps to take one of my comrades with me. <laughs> with all my heart, said the king, who thought he had so much ale and wine that the whole seven of them would soon get more than their skins could hold. But the ash lad only took with him the man who sucked the tap and who had such a swallow for ale, and then the king locked them both up in the cellar. So he drank cask after cask, as long as there were any left. But at last he spared a drop or two, about as much as a quart or two for each of his comrades. Next morning, they unlocked the cellar, and the ash lad strode off at once to the king, and said he was done with the ale and wine, and now he must have his daughter, as he had given his word. Ay, ay, but uh, I must go down into the cellar and see said the king, for he didn't believe it. But 
When he got to the cellar, there was nothing in it but empty casks. But the ash lad was still black and smutty. And the king thought he never could bear to have such a fellow for his son-in-law. So he said, no, but all the same. If he could fetch him water from the world's end in ten minutes for the princess's tea, he should have both her and half the realm. For he thought that quite out of his power. I can but try, said the ash lad. So he laid hand on him who limped on one leg with seven hundred weight on the other. And he said he must unbuckle the weights and use both legs as fast as he could, for he must have water from the world's inn for the princess's tea in ten minutes. So he took off the weights, got a pail, and set off, and was out of sight in trice. But time went, and yet he did not come back. At last there was no more than three minutes left till the time was up, and the king was as pleased as though someone had given him a horse. But just then the ash lad bawled out to him who heard the grass grow and bade him listen and hear what had become of the other. He has fallen asleep at the well, he said. I can hear him snoring, and a troll is combing his hair. So the ash lad called him who would shoot to the world's end and bade him put a bullet into the troll. Yes, he did that, and shot him right in the eye. And the troll set up such a howl that he woke up at once the one that was to fetch the water for tea. And when he got back to the king's grange, there was still one minute left of the ten. Then the lad strode into the king and said there was the water. And now he must have the princess there. Must be no more words about it. But the king thought him just as sooty and smutty as before, and did not at all like to have him as a son-in-law. So the king said he had three hundred fathoms of wood, and he was about to dry corn in the malt house with him. And all the same, if you are man enough to get inside it while I burn up all the fuel, you shall have her, and I will make no more bones about it. <laughs> I can but try, said the ash lad, but I must have leave to take one of my crew with me. <laughs> yes, yes, said the king. All six of them, if you like, for he thought it would be warm enough in there for all of them. But the ash lad took with him the man who had fifteen winters and seven summers inside him, and they trudged off to the malt house at night. But the king had laid the fuel on thick, and there was such a fire burning, it almost melted the stove. Out again they could not come, for they had scarce set foot inside, then the king shot the bolt beside them and hung two padlocks on the door outside. Then the ash lad said, You'd better slip out a six or seven winters at once so that it may be nice summer heat. Then the heat fell, and they could bear it. But on in the night it began to grow chilly. So the ash lad said he must make it milder with two summers. And then they slept till far on the next day. But when they heard the king rattling at the door outside, the ash lad said, now you must let slip two more winters, but lay them on so that the last may go full in his face. Yes, he did so. And when the king unlocked the malt house door and thought to find them lying there burnt to cinders, there they sat, shivering and shaking till their teeth chattered. And the man with the fifteen winters let slip the last right into the king's face, so that it swelled up once into a big frostbite. May I have your daughter now, said the ash lad. Yes, yes, pray take her and keep her and half the realm beside, said the king, for he couldn't say no any longer. So they held the bridal feast and kept it up and rejoiced and fired off witch shots. And meanwhile, they weren't looking about for charges. And then they took me and gave me porridge and a flask and milk in a basket. And then they shot me off here to you that I might tell you all how the wedding went. 
And here is where I end my tale for today. But I'll be back with more tales. Many more tales. Until then, my friends, enjoy the journey.